Okay, welcome everybody to the Monday stream where we're going to do some life drawing to warm up as per usual. And then we're going to get into uh, continuing to paint our uh, bounty hunter outlaw character. So let's get into it. Okay, sorry, I had a spider on my desk. <laughs> Jumped off of my pencil. Uh, okay, so we're going to get our model up on screen. And we're gonna start to get into the really rough uh, painting, right? Um, just keeping things super loose in the beginning so that uh, we're, not, um, we're not getting too precious as per usual. I got some red up, let's try that out. Hey, I'm doing good. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Went to reach for my stylus and it hopped off. Spooked me. But he's a little guy, so it's fine. And I don't live in Australia, so it's not going to kill me. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Switch the pose up a little bit. Everybody had a good weekend. Uh, yeah, we have jumping spiders here, but the, that wasn't one of them. It's the spider that jumped. <laughs> now he's in behind my monitor. I can see him. He's joining me on the stream. Hopefully he'll take care of all the little critters that uh, creep around otherwise. I don't mind spiders so much, at least here. Um, they're creepy crawly, but they, they get rid of the annoying bugs. I think so. I'm down with any creature that does that, as long as I can handle the uh, creepy crawly. Trying to stay loose. Just catch yourself. Sometimes I, I settle into drawing things a little bit slow. Um, so just catch yourself and go faster, right? Let's get a good view of uh, her from back side. Hey, Patrick. There goes the spider. <laughs> he's lagging the warmth from my monitor now. He's the he's the uh, mascot for today's stream. The little wolf spider. face here
Big spiders, yeah. I was in Australia years ago now, but uh, I went into the sort of one of their really nice national parks um, called Litchfield. And uh, I saw the biggest spider of my life. It was a orb weaver, female. And uh, she had made a nest above the, uh, the pathway. And she was absolutely massive, bigger than my head. Um, and she had all these little spiders, these male spiders on her, her nest, um, just sitting up around her. And uh, tried to get the, the nest down because it's like right over the pathway and took this log and caught the nest and she went skittering away, which was hyper creepy. Um, but it couldn't pull down the nest. It was super strong. Those birds are the bird eating spiders, those big ones. Um, so yeah, needless to say, I was sketched out. Um, and then there's the huntsmen, which are big boys as well, or can be. <clears throat> Let's switch up the pose. Do you get spiders that are a dot of a body but have long legs? Yeah, yeah, we, we do. They always like to crawl into the shower. We leave our bedroom sliding door open for air conditioning in the summer so some of those guys make it inside and then they just sit there starve to death in the bathroom because no other bugs go in there so we have to take them put them outside in the garden so they don't die crawling around here somewhere I don't know where I should name them something to do with life drawing pinching in the back on this specific pose for the model. Kind of seeing her from the her rear left or her rear right side. It's an interesting kind of pivot on the hips. It's always good to kind of draw the body from as many kind of different angles as you can. So you start seeing some of these forms in, in different directions and you start to kind of understand the, uh, the structures a bit more. I mentioned this a little bit in my classes whenever I do go into anatomy is a lot of people remember sort of the symbols of how they learn to draw the human body which is not necessarily accurate and may, may only work in one view because you can cheat a lot in 2D. Right, so 
it's always good to kind of familiarize yourself with the entire volume of of the uh of the human figure in there especially warming up give her a little bit of hair popping off of there Eating spider that escaped the cage when I was seven. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think spiders bite mostly because they get squished or stepped on. I don't think spiders come up to bite you specifically. Make mistake you for something warm and delectable, but I think for the most part, spiders just the venom is what's. bad time is but <laughs> this brush is making this model look like she's not had sleep in many days that's fine though. We're only sketching, so we don't need to have the most beautiful awake models. Flying insects. There's some really interesting ones in Nova Scotia. Um, get like dragonflies, and I haven't been uh, super far east in Canada, which is funny because I've been to a lot of like Australian major towns and cities. Um, but uh, no, I think for the most part, some of the uh, central parts of Canada where there's a lot of standing water, you get some pretty massive mosquitoes. But uh, Big horse flies, June bugs, that kind of thing. Pretty common in different parts of the world for those stuff, those kinds of things though. Slowing down a little bit here. look like blue bottle flies I'm not actually sure what a blue bottle looks like um, they're big 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 flies if you kind of swat at them you really feel their weight when you connect with one because they're really big boys um, and they yeah they take this they've got this sort of like little triangular mandible um, and they take a bite out of you definitely feel it but it's too late by then
Do you have any tips on drawing feet? That's a good question. Um, yeah. So when one of the things when you when drawing feet, I think almost whenever you're drawing anything, <clears throat> excuse me, in the human body, um, you think about sort of why these things have evolved to look the way that they do, right? And feet have a very interesting construction. So um, what's one way to think of it? Uh, you can think about a bridge. When you look at bridges when they're built, they're not built flat, typically. There's going to be some sort of bend to a bridge so that when load is applied, you know, there's, there's some structure to hold it up rather than starting flat. So when a load applies, it collapses, right? And so um, our feet are really similar to that in one way or on one side, the inside edge. You get the arch of your foot in here. So let's use a different uh, color. Use red. I'm actually gonna switch my brush a little bit here. So we get, we get this inside arch in here. Um, guys up so that's a little bit more clean we get this inside arch in here but the outside of the foot you'll notice kind of contacts the ground evenly so what we end up seeing is sort of if we were to kind of make a bit of a diagram out of it is this this sort of uh, shape in here right and I'm generalizing it of course this would be the arch of your foot this would be the outside edge and of course your toes come out the end right but what happens is a lot of the time you, you center your weight over your feet, but your weight is going to be centered in between them. Right now, this model that I'm drawing, her legs are crossed. That's why the feet are, they look like this. But uh, that's, that's, that arch is in there for support, right? And the outside edge being flat kind of creates, you can kind of think of it as a, um, like a more stable structure. So the outside edge is sort of where things plant. The inside edge is where things are arched for um, for support, and uh, unless you've got fallen arches, right? I've got pretty bad fallen arches on my feet. A lot of people do. Um, I don't know why specifically, but maybe it's just the quality of shoes around. But uh, but that's what happens. And when you see people's footprints, you can also see this, right? You see the heel. You see a little bit of the outside edge of that foot, right? and then you see the ball of the foot. But you usually don't see the contact on the, um, the arch, right? And, and so that's one way of thinking about it. Um, the other thing is, is your toes don't typically come straight out of your foot. And you see a lot of people drawing feet that way, right? Um, what you'll notice when you look at your own feet is sort of the angle of your big toes starts to angle almost um, to if we're staring out straight from our feet your right foot toes will angle out towards the right by a little bit and your left foot would angle out a little bit that way to the left and so if we're looking at our little splashed foot here um, your big toe is going to travel more this way right and then your toes will kind of meet up with it so you get sort of like this angle shift in there i mean the outside toe kind of arches inward a little bit but you think about that and then you think about that when you see shoes and you see the shoe angle uh say the sole of the shoe let's draw it over here sole of the shoe kind of might move up like this and then you've got the heel in there now what you don't see in the shoe print is that the there'll be an arch on the shoe so if you go and pick up say you've got uh, I know this from men's shoes that the inside will have an arch the outside will be a little bit more kind of uniformly flat because it's following the same rules here right um, but it of course will uh, let's actually draw a shoe on the bottom of here so that heel will come to here right and go underneath and then what you'll typically see is uh, they'll cut the sole a little bit in depending on the shoe build right and then you'll get the base of the shoe in there right but the leather will be kind of running up this way a little bit for the arch of the shoe if the shoe is really good it'll have arch support right um, some aesthetic shoes just will not have that kind of thing but uh, there you go
right? So you think about that, say even with uh, exposed uh, sold shoes, probably more like a, a woman's shoe, right? Where you get a lot of kind of like, or a heel, right? That's kind of pushing that stuff around. All of those things exist still, especially in heels. But, but with a heel, kind of pushes the human foot down. If we're looking at the inside edge, you'd see the inside arch of the foot. You'd see the calcaneus there. And then that's where you'd have that heel, right? And then the sole would come down and basically you're planting on the, the ball of your foot. And that's where the toes would come out um, for the base of the, the heel itself. And then that's why you're gonna get that look, right? Depending on sort of the, the high heel or whatever. So just variants of that. Um, but the structure remains the same, right? I, you know, like seeing some, some of the sort of pumps and, and uh, high heel shoes that uh, people wear boggles my mind of how like, how uncomfortable it looks, right? Because you're pressing into the ball of your feet, kind of almost on your tippy toes, right? But uh, even within that, the, the structures remain. So, um, so you think about that, right? You just kind of think about that kind of thing. Otherwise, you can start to break these things down into groupings, right? You can make your life a little bit easier by thinking about, um, like, let's actually make it more of a diagram here. You've got sort of the core of the foot in there, right? Almost looks like a kid's shoe. You're going to give room to the front of that foot for toes, and you're going to be thinking about a calcaneus at the back, which is your heel right and then that connects to a joint which runs up into your tibia slash fibula right so you know those bones are fixed <clears throat> tibia and fibula your ankle is where those bones pivot into your foot you know you can maybe we're looking at the inside edge of our our foot in here right and then you can kind of break it down into that point where you're going to get your first your other hinge which is gonna be at your uh, at your toes, right? Your calcaneus isn't going to flex, but it's good to know that that's, that's a bone that juts out of the back of the foot, right? And so if you work with things in that regard, just breaking them down a little bit, you'll make room for them. What I tend to see people is like, they kind of know that there's a bump here. And you know, every, I think everyone knows it's an ankle, but you don't think of that as being the end of bones right that actually attach to more bones in the foot right and so you're going to get a massing of bones in by the calcaneus there um, and then it's going to move out into our little toe digits on the outside edge right and so i would say you know when you're drawing feet you want to think about that stuff um, especially when you are uh, taking time to look at a model um, you know, you can look at their feet and start to break down those shapes again and be like, oh, that's why they're there. That's why it looks like that, right? You can even see on certain models, like, oh, wow, they're, the arch in their foot's really flat, like mine would be, right? So hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, horse flies take a chunk out of, out of your body. I don't mind swatting them at that point. Let's uh, switch back to our nice brush. We'll do a hand and we'll get to the bounty hunter outlaw. So not every life drawing session has to be sort of super long, right? Um, sometimes you, you don't have time or you want to get onto other things uh, like we do today um, and you'll kind of maybe move through that a little bit faster right through the session a little bit faster which I think is is fair that's fine right it's not not everything needs to be uh, approached the same way it's sort of like the habit is what matters there right so um, that's what I'd be looking for.
master studio door broken. No. It is not. Uh, okay, so kind of warmed up there, right? Feeling pretty good. Um, I mean, use your judgment um, and and spend as much time as you you feel is necessary, right? Um, again, just in terms of that, just make sure that you're uh, looking at um, details and. Uh, and thinking about forms, maybe breaking them down into more simple forms. Um, people will build their own sort of ways of looking at the body. Once you once you look at it enough, right, you'll start to understand those those forms um, on your own uh, if you're paying attention to it, right? So really good to be doing that. Let's load up our lock. <clears throat> and uh, we'll take a look at what we got. We're just gonna. We can leave that open for now. Actually, let's just save that. Up to. Sometimes it's nice to look back on some of our our stuff. Okay, and we'll get rid of it. All right. So looking at uh, last week, we were kind of trying to get the center line on the body a little bit more oh well, positioned a bit better um, on our character. So that's what we did there. Uh, we've got our line layer back up on top. So um, that can be something that uh, if we start to go too far, you know, I can come back to that. So it's always sort of like my blueprint. So, um, yeah. Uh, what brushes do I use? I'll use anything, really. The brushes really don't matter to me. Um, in the case of what I was using here, this was uh, Greg Rutkowski sells some brushes, and uh, it looks sort of like this, this stroke in there. Fairly simple to produce. You uh, get into the brush engine, right? But, you know, I can draw with anything. Um, you know, a... Uh, one of the things that you'd want to look for for a brush potentially if you want to not be committing to too much um, really hard edge line work is just something that feels uh, a bit looser right maybe there's some texture to it there are so many brushes out there that you can look at or create on your own but uh, it's more it's less about the brush it's more about just having the habit of the, the good habit of um, up life drawing right and so i mean that's that's more of what i would focus on in there it's like kind of translating from what you're seeing to the mind to the, the canvas um in a way that's accurate but also kind of helps you understand those things right so you know, i really try anything um okay so we're not doing too bad here. What, what we are doing is we're, um, let's just commit that down. Um, we're probably gonna focus sort of more on the upper portion of the body uh, in terms of the, the stream. We won't get time to get to Oliver. I would like to move on to another design by then. Um, but we can start to establish the, the look for, for her here. Um, we were getting rid of a little bit of our line work last time, so that's going pretty well, I think. <clears throat> Get in there and kind of paint out some of the uh, some of the other kind of rougher lines that we had going on. I have a multiply on, that's why that's doing that. Just go through and start to clean this up. Say the idea that she's she's more of a bounty hunter than an outlaw. 
she interfaces with the, the sheriffs and whatnot, but she is the one lived by. The organization. She wants to kind of go up and catch the bad guys. I'm just gonna come in here and kind of clean some of this stuff up at the top. I'm using an airbrush, which is creating this really soft edge on almost everything that I'm painting here, which I'm not too, too worried about, to be honest, because I'm, I'm roughing that stuff in so I can, uh, so I can apply a little bit more detail uh, a bit later. Um, If I do need such a hard edge, then I can go and pick a hard edge brush. Turn my smoothing on if I want. I want to kind of have a bit more control over that. Got a nice sort of edge on that. There we go. I think it's okay for her hat not to be kind of like perfect. It'll probably be warped a little bit when she gets into the scuffles with the bad guys. Um, she'll just pick it up out of the dirt and dust it off and put it back on. She's hardcore like that. up top thinking about the light coming down from the sky you know if it's a daylight situation then a lot of that lights going to be coming in from above right so it would stand a reason that we're gonna get say on the tie scarf whatever she has kind of wrapped around her her uh, hat that's gonna receive more of that light I've got a nice airbrush there so I can select just the top of that and have some of that fade down into the rest of the hat. Hey Val, welcome, welcome. Thank you, by the way. I sent Nadia your info, so hopefully she gets in contact with you. She's really excited to hear about it. So if you haven't heard from her, I'm sure you will. preference with genders and character design uh, like do you prefer designing male characters over female characters or vice versa um, not really I mean I think it just depends on the context um, I would say that 
maybe I, I gravitate more towards female characters just because it's more unusual to me as a, as a male human being. Um, it's more interesting to learn about things that I don't know about, right? And kind of practice those things. Um, male characters, though, are really fun to do in lots of different situations. Um, so I don't have a real preference, I guess. I might gravitate towards one, though, than the other. But, uh, yeah, no, it's... Same for, like, animals or creatures. I don't really have a favorite, per se. Um, I'd probably be more inclined to do... I, I think anyone's more inclined to do creatures and characters you're used to seeing or familiar with. It's just easier. Um, which, you know, if you, if you recognize you're doing that, maybe you go in and try something different that'll uh, challenge you. So, yeah, we might do a male character next just because we haven't yet. Um, maybe we'll do sort of like a creature slash character so we can kind of use some of our anatomy practice uh, to help inform some of our design. Could always be fun. If the voice is low, I'll, uh, I'll turn down the old music a little bit. Ramp up the voice. How's that? A bit better? Do you still look at references when it comes to things like hats or clothing or you just use knowledge at this point? Uh, for me, I'll always run a little bit of reference on the side. Um, whenever I start to feel like I'm just making it up and I'm not even convincing myself of it, right? I'll look at reference. Some of these things I'll stage first and then I know I'll have to go in when I go to finish it. I'll go in and... Uh, um, I'll fix that up, right? Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, it just depends. It just depends. Some things I'm way more familiar with. Um, but I'm all for reference, right? Why, I don't know, some people I've heard in the past sort of think that n not using reference means you're a better artist or, or something along those lines. I don't know where anyone would get that idea because at the end of the day you're making at least for a commercial artist you're making artwork to try and convince people of something right and no one's going to really have insight into whether or not <clears throat> you use reference so why does it matter at that point you know reference is a great way to learn i think so let's turn this off there we go struggling a little bit to kind of cut some of the filaments into this feather. Doing something like this, for instance, you know, I know the effect I'm going for and I'm kind of roughing it in. Um, cause I want, I don't want the feather on her hat to feel like it's too, um, too perfect and uniform, right? So I'm kind of taking chunks out of it, but I can come back in if I overdo it a little bit. I can reduce some of the uh, texture and make it feel a little bit more like, a little bit more <clears throat> realistic. I know a feather is going to have quill to it, so let's get a mildly lighter value. I'm going to turn my smoothing back up, and then what I can do is kind of run that through the middle of the, the feather there. Uh, I'm not going to use a... I'm not going to use an airbrush.
you find in the, the video games you play uh, influence um, influence your art a lot? Yeah, I mean, everybody. I worked with people who would play a video game, say like game designers, and then they would come in the next day and start making changes to the design because they were inspired by something, which is great. It's great to be inspired, but just gotta watch out being derivative, right? Um, I think it's always the slippery slope there. Um, but no, of, of course, playing games and watching films are great ways to, to kind of learn what other people are doing, learn what's possible, just springboard off of those ideas. So that's great. <clears throat> Do you think of Westworld? Excellent. So what I did there um, is I had a mask applied to to her and uh, I kind of didn't want to have to keep dealing with the mask to, to be able to paint and draw. So I want to keep the transparency I set up in the mask. So the way of solving that is you turn it to a smart object, which you saw me do. Uh, and then I rasterized it. Um, that's just a really easy way of kind of committing your uh, your masking to an eraser almost in the file. And now she's set up that way. I can go into my eraser now and I can erase instead of masking certain things, which I think for my purposes right now, I want to do. So I shall do it. Go clean some of this stuff up. I might want to kind of reconfigure the hat. It's part of the reason why I flatten things a little bit. The brim, as it approaches us, is a little bit thin compared to how big it, is, it looks going into the back there. I could raise that up, <clears throat> but I want to try kind of maybe moving the, the, the hat outwards by a little bit. So I'm just going to kind of select the brim in here. Copy paste it. The reason I copy paste it is that I want it to be just a separate element. I don't want to ruin the original art. So kind of just making that a little bit bigger there. That doesn't feel too bad. <clears throat> one of the things I could do is flip it so that we get a similar shape from one side to the other. Which might work a little bit better for us. Take a look at that. It just kind of adds a little bit more to the front. I can maybe move it out a little bit as well. Not too worried about some of that overlap. I can always just edge that in by a hint. Maybe something like that. And then I'm just gonna go in and erase some of the stuff at the back. <clears throat> and then I can just commit that. Now I'll just be going in and painting on top, which isn't a difficult thing to be doing. Oops. Actually, we got the brush brush tool selected and then our, we'll get our other brush going. 
I'll just kind of meld that in for now. So that feels a bit better. Take a step back from the piece, so to speak, and see how that feels. Doesn't feel too bad for right now. We'll leave it. Maybe I'll change it just a little bit more, but I feel pretty good about roughing that out for now. Um, take a look at what we got. So sometimes uh, when you want to save, save some time, um, like for, for us, I could go in there and start painting a, a backdrop, right? Um, a few things you can do. I mean, you can paint the backdrop based on reference, right? Um, let's go and look at um, uh, Mesa Top Mountains. And let's gather something that looks pretty cool. So we might want something that's like, uh, I mean, Monument Valley, some buttes. Um, let's take a look at some imagery here, copy image. Kind of take anything, um, kind of paste it in there. All right, it might be that there's something in the backdrop could use. Um, no one image is better than another, I, I would say at this point, you know. So it's like you could you could just grab something random off the internet um, and, and start painting that in there. Um, you could desaturate it and use it as kind of just photo bashed background. Um, so there's lots, lots to do in there. Um, let's go back, we're gonna use it we're going to use reference. So I would say at this point, you know, if you're following along, go find some, some nice reference for that kind of thing. And, uh, and then we're just going to kind of get in there and paint it. Just deciding on what kind of reference I want. <coughs> If you're ever just interested in um, finding reference Getty and, and reference websites, if you're if you're not needing the actual files, are really great to just go and see because they have lots of keywords assigned to these things, and you can always just have them up. Maybe they're in a smaller window or something, but you can kind of paint from them, right? Um, if you're just looking for a more efficient way of of building building some art, so. Just going through, let's grab a different brush here. Um, you could always grab like a textured brush. Uh, for me, you know, that's not super necessary uh, as, you know, I can paint the texture in there, but you can always have fun by going to find brushes that make certain textural effects and whatnot. Um, for our purposes though, I might even just go with a hard round with some some uh, pen pressure set to transfer because I just want to rough things out, right? So we know our, our highlights are kind of coming from up above. Maybe create the silhouette of, of that shape first. Really kind of carve it out. Right in there. Um, get in there with like a really hard eraser. Then we can make this sort of like really rigid edge to it. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm just, I'm deleting the sky cause I'm gonna probably pop in a sky in behind that. So I don't, you know, the original rough was fine, but now we wanna actually do something with it. So, so we're just gonna get rid of it for now. It's 
good to know where your your horizon line is because you're going to be building this stuff you don't want it to be um you don't ever want to be approaching sort of life drawing where you're not considering perspective because everything is in perspective right um one of the larger mistakes i'd say that students make is not you know practicing basic drawing of perspective it's uh <clears throat> in terms of concept art not really core to concept art it's more core to knowing how to draw so always good to uh take a look at that practice that <clears throat> okay so i've kind of isolated those for now i'm just going to go with the alpha lock and uh And then start kind of painting in there with uh, with that hard brush again. So by by kind of putting strokes over top of other strokes, I can create sort of some striations in the stone, right? Um, one of the things I can do even within this is is sort of make a selection and then run some value through that. Um, with kind of combination of those striations and then we get something that starts to feel a little bit more rigid rocky maybe right did anything in particular inspire you for this one um nope i just kind of started drawing um yeah not all the time you know, part of what you get good at as a concept artist is um, designing on the fly. And uh, that's obviously really good for clients because, um, you know, they sometimes come up, come to you with uh, different needs and um, I guess you could say... Uh, just problems that maybe come and crop up. So it's uh, it's good to be able to kind of design on the fly. There's a lot of tropes and cliches and that kind of thing. You can look at it negatively, but a lot of people like similar things or it's like why certain franchises run forever because people get into zombie films or they get into westerns or they get into sci-fi right so like what kind of stories can you tell with those kinds of characters and you know just go from there let's run some breaks and striations down through here That's not too bad. We can start to get, uh, get some of these mesas. And uh, it's almost like you can imagine if you were to create a sand castle and then slowly, you know, when you create sand castles with sort of wet sand, um, you get the, the sand sloughing off sometimes into piles. And so I get that kind of vibe with, with our mesa tops here where we're getting some of that sand or that um, material kind of spilling down and out. You know, there might be kind of soft striations within that. We're going to get kind of a lot of, uh, the formation is vertical or horizontal to the ground. So what I'm doing in here is I'm just creating some of that striation. Some of these things will get hit by darker values and control shift I will invert your selection and you can hit 
things on the outside edge of that, right? Kind of start to create really rough passes on, on some rigid detailing. <clears throat> you know, we might even get, uh, might get some pathways or some striations that start to point to the uh, perspective in the scene. Just kind of popping in between the negative spaces in between her arm and the horse kind of thing, right? We're not focusing a ton of effort and energy into the details of this, but just a little bit absolutely helps, right? It helps you kind of establish like where she's sitting and what, what we're looking out at. So we've turned that off. I'm going to go kind of grab this edge and give that a harder shadow. Flipping it and the erasing to get that more severe edge there. Kind of a nice way to compositionally to lead down into to her. Um, and kind of thinking about the perspective. I might throw something in behind that. It's just like a horizon line. So I'm just making that selection to be able to kind of produce that distant feel in there. Something at least. And then behind these, I'll throw in a sky gradient. Um, it's gonna look weird when I first lay it out here, but let's just work with that. I only really want it to affect the top part up into our horizon. So I'll just isolate it there and then I can go in with my, um, my grayscale here. We don't want it that way, we want it the other way. actually want to zoom out quite a bit because I don't want to feel like it's dusk. I just want some of that lighter value at the base. So let's try a little bit of a different vibe there. So that's not too bad. Um, I still want that gray to be able to receive blue uh, color, right? And then just to be able to break some of those, those shapes up, so. All right, dead. Uh, yeah, probably. I mean, I love that game. Um, and uh, yeah, I, that's probably what I'm, what I'm referencing. Usually comes from somewhere, right? So get rid of the mask like that. Yeah, it's super helpful. So it's, that's why I, I kind of, when I first started painting professionally, I guess as a concept artist, I didn't really do much with masking. And then I realized how helpful it is to be non-destructive with your editing. Or if you want to be, it's as simple as that is smart object, then rasterize basically is a nice big eraser for you. So you can always set up your scene, erase into it using the mask and then just commit it when you're ready, right? That's a nice way of doing it. The only time I wouldn't do that was if I needed to preserve it right for whatever reason maybe i'm not sure that i should have erased some certain things and then i go back right so um anyway here you go so let's get some of these guys going so i'm thinking about that horizon maybe we're gonna kind of have little plateaus What I'm after here is just trying to find little spots where I can inject surfaces that we can see down onto, sort of like flat surfaces on uh, on this. And following perspective, as it, it moves away from that horizon, obviously it's gonna open up a lot more, right? So I'll just do something like that. We'll go get some of this value. Uh, let's go back to that layer, lock those pixels so we're only drawing on that mountain. Let me see something like that, right? So when you guys are painting this stuff, don't just put that stuff in there, right? I mean, you can, like for me, it's like first pass 
see how that feels. But you can also finesse that. You can make it feel like maybe some, let's grab a brush here and show you what I'm talking about. Instead of making these lines or at the end of all of this, your lines kind of just flatly point in towards her or you get this basic sense of volume. You can have that th those lines actually be interesting and wind and tell a story of these different volumes on this rock, but also make it a little bit more dynamic as it moves into your character, right? That they're not all kind of evenly spaced out, creating almost like this chaotic pattern, right? You want it to feel maybe a little bit more biomorphic. So when I lay these things in there, I kind of get a look of whether or not the, or sorry, a feel for whether or not the look feels good. Um, and then I can go back in there at any point and change that, right? Which I definitely would do, because I want to kind of feel like maybe there's a little valley that pinches out towards in between those two buttes uh, or mesas, whatever you want to talk, call them. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, that might be something that I can do in here. Let's go back to that layer. Let's have some of the stuff like really wind and disappear. <clears throat> and we'll get some of that, some of that value out see how that feels a little bit better right come in here and block some of this stuff in At this point I can kind of run in and I can build these little striations or cuts or breaks or whatever in the in the cliff all the way up It's like a really short amount of time kind of clipping some of this stuff out and you do get some pretty good results right just drawing with that lasso tool it's not my favorite thing to do in the world because it's very still like photoshop mechanical but hey if it gets the results can't be upset about that Let's get some darker vibes moving up. And then I can go back in and cut in. And then we always just have our brush um, without lassoing, right? You can kind of create these little noisy formation elements, whatever they may be, right? pretty razor sharp on those edges. So I could even go in there sort of on this side. Part of that graphic quality is really nice, but at the same time, she's not very graphic so far. So I might kind of go in here and just, you know, rough in, imagine sort of the surface of some of those rocks. Then I can get into something straighter as it moves up. So kind of create a crispy edge there and then kind of maybe I go into more of like faceted stone geometry as we move up into that space. So 
something that looks like that. where I can get some of that almost like spill of the material as it falls off. I do like to target other areas like the negative space, say underneath the horse's tail here. It's just sort of like that's an opening. Underneath the belly is an opening. Anywhere is an opening, right? So is there anything I can put in there that will help you guys understand sort of what I'm thinking in terms of volumes? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of, lots of different things we could do. Um, so maybe I start establishing just a little bit of that. You know, would that be a place to put a horseshoe print? sort of has us moving in this direction. Maybe, maybe we just be able to see one in here. <clears throat> maybe some, some grass. something at least. Simple to do that. We can come in here and maybe make this one a little bit more exciting. For like a quick turnaround, right? Um, on, on the uh, the details there. Uh, it'll be interesting to see who will win the game, console wars. I don't really think it's a war. It's been going on for long enough. No one's won, right? I think people just want different things. Myself, you know, I'll get whatever console that I feel like I need to buy. I don't really have a, an allegiance to one or the other. <clears throat> um, Shape Carver guy who worked uh, at Riot. He does a lot of amazing artwork, almost only using the Elastic tool. Yeah, it's super useful, right? Um, as long as you can draw with that marquee uh, selection you know it's you, you can create anything um, something like that's also what you'd want to well not the only thing you'd want to do in something like illustrator but very helpful way of building up uh, vector illustrations is by using the lasso tool to draw with right and then filling it with uh, different um, uh, 
different uh, uh, gradient maps, right? So that can be a nice, nice way of doing it. Um, it's one of the tools, right? So if you have access to this thing, which is basically what would be similar to an artist in say the fifties before something like Photoshop of actually creating a physical mask and then kind of airbrushing in that hard edge shape, right? For us, it's as simple as click the marquee selection tool, draw, and then paint within it um, with whatever, like texture, doesn't matter, right? Whatever, whatever makes sense. So yeah, super useful. Scott Flanders, I'll, yeah, I'll check that out. Um, no, no, no. Let's get back to our lady here. Let me get the edge of that hat looking a little bit more busted up. We'll kind of follow that edge all the way around. So we've left a lot of uh, a lot of opportunity for ourselves to use a brighter value, right? So some of our brightest values on her are, you know, in the 67% brightness range. Some of that maybe gets up to 70, right? Which leaves us a ton for for lighting. So if I were to go in here all of a sudden and and put a white hot spot on her nose or a speck highlight on her eye or something like that, uh, we can really get some of this stuff overexposing um, fairly quickly, right? Feeling really bright now against that backdrop which is a benefit to us because we want to be able to access that if at all possible when we start to get to more of a polish on this. I've seen some students of mine in the past, uh, they'll get in and, and they'll, they'll blast everything with an overexposure um, right away, right? And just because they're maybe used to like, well, they're used to thinking that white is what you use for a highlight which uh, is not true. You can use it, but uh, you have to just remember that there's not any other values above 100% brightness white. Uh, so there's, if you want any detail in there, you're not gonna be able to see it because there's none left, right? Uh, you can't keep pushing it, so food for thought. Just round this out a little bit more. Oh, that feels a bit better. I can always go in and repair that feather. I haven't spent tons of time with the feather, so I'm not too worried about the details at that point. Just want to get the hat feeling a bit more in tune with the perspective. That's not feeling too bad. Almost get maybe some discoloration in the hat maybe where there's almost like sweat stain or like we want to make her feel like she's out in harsh elements in here so we don't want the hat to feel like it's brand new or anything like that feel a little bit beat up I think the Nintendo console graphics are a bit of a joke compared to the Xbox and PlayStation U consoles. 
Nintendo's great if you're five years old. Yeah, I guess if that's what you're looking for, you could look at it that way. Uh, I tend to see that Nintendo makes the most uh, thoughtful games in terms of design. Um, and they are definitely not suffering. I think their um, Switch sales are... And I know their, their Wii sales were dominant over the other consoles. Well, not dominant, but... Um, competitive and they're diff different games right it's very different titles so um, I don't think Nintendo's Nintendo's not had to go anywhere or do follow suit right with competing with Sony and Xbox like I said I own a PS4, an Xbox One, and a Switch. So, if you're, I guess if you're kind of limited budget wise in, in picking one, then you know, you'd pick one that had the um, exclusives that you wanted or, or whatever, right? But for some people, it's not an issue. For me, I'd, I'd love that there's competition. Don't I don't want anybody to win a war so to speak <laughs> Never owned one? Excellent. It's always cool to hear. Some people just don't care. Right? I mean, some people like uh, mobile games more. Um, I wanted to have a cool earring. It'd be like a switchblade. Or a bullet. Maybe a bullet that uh, she was shot with when trying to hunt down a bounty. And she got it made into uh, an earring. Because she's hardcore. We'll, we'll kind of play with that. Maybe it's not something that will stay in there, but we'll have fun with that for now. Oh, you're just, yeah, PC gamer. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, like, then you get into that sort of, that whole argument of console wars and gate PC gamers and whatnot. So, yeah, my, I've, I don't have, I stopped buying so many Steam games during Steam sales and that kind of thing. I think I've got something like 300 some games, um, a lot of which I haven't even opened, so... Um, I am more of a, a PC gamer than I would say a console gamer, but again, sort of the, the nature of the job, um, especially having worked in games for an, the lion's share of my time as a concept artist, you know, it's, it's something that you should reference, right? If you're going to do work for anybody and they have a game out and you can't play it, not going to look super great going into a, uh, an interview. So, it'd be super useful. Let's get a little bit of light on this side where.
So we're just going to mash up some of that smoke with a simple airbrush smudge. One of the few times I'll actually use this just simple brushes for something like this where I can kind of pull some of that around to make it feel like smoke. messed it up a little bit well intentionally um, just to kind of get some of the graphic quality out of there uh, still be something I'll come back to for sure <clears throat> I mean that's definitely something even with a uh, marquee selection tool you can kind of come in here and create some interesting sort of shapes and then go use an airbrush kind of popped a little bit of that just around the edges maybe whatever we like I do want to draw attention more to the face, so I'll I'll hit, I'll hit that with a lot more of the uh, the brighter values. So maybe I'll reserve a bit so that I can, ever, if I decide at some point I want to overexpose this, I can always get in there and do that. So if like, say she was uh, pulling air through that cigarette and you wanted to kind of create a sense of heat, right? That emissive light might be coming from the core of the, the cigarette, right? Kind of burning through some of that stuff in there, which at a distance we don't maybe fully appreciate, but it, it you know, the vibration of information in there uh, seems believable. So we can come in here and kind of clean some of this up real quick. Pixels. I'm just going to pull some of that stuff out to the outer edge of her jacket there.
Brandon Vicky, chairman. Just want to say that a few days ago, the first series for which I did concept art for was released, and I'm super excited. Couldn't have done it without you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm glad to see the success out there for some of my students. Um, see you kind of growing on your own now. That's great. Do you have any tips for being motivated with art? Uh, I'm having trouble getting motivated. Um, well, there's lots of different things. There's lots of different causes for lack of motivation, I suppose. Um, one of the things might be that you start building up a bit of a story in your head of how things are going to go wrong or how hard things are. And you kind of talk yourself out of actually doing anything. I'd say the easiest thing to motivate yourself is just start. Don't start with a grand idea. Just sit down at, at something that you're going to draw with. And just start sketching, sketching random stuff just to warm up. Something that's a little bit meaningless so that you don't hang a lot of pressure on yourself, right? Um, because that's usually it is us talking ourselves out of things. That's why someone would watch TV instead. That's why they would play video games instead. It's because you know you can turn that on and it doesn't matter, right? And it's you can escape and you can uh, give yourself the illusion of achieving something, right? I mean, there's achievements in games, but really it means nothing right it literally can get wiped wiped away if a hard drive gets nuked somewhere right so whereas you can eventually achieve something with art so you can look forward to that trading that time and that skill for money right and enjoyment uh, on your own um where like video games are almost like a drug where it's sort of like the next hit is what you need you know the new shooter the new fighting game the new blah 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 and you achieve stuff in there and then you know that game fades away and you need a new one right whereas all that time can be spent on or majority of your time can be spent on actually building the skill which actually does feel fun later right a lot of the time when you're a new artist it's hard to um hard to imagine what that's like because you're you know your skill levels down here and you want it to be up here Right? You're looking at all these other people that have actually done all that work and you want to kind of just be there, but you have to spend the time, right? So as long as you understand that, that's the expectation, then you can get into just starting those things, just like we're doing today, right? Is just getting in there and drawing. I was drawing random stuff, right? From a model, getting loose, getting, making that feel good. I'm sitting at the Cintiq. I've got music on and I'm drawing right so then after maybe a session of that you can go okay well now i'm going to start a character you can start roughing that out and and a lot of the times that will help you the only other thing i would say is have an idea of what you want to produce what goals you have for a, a, an asset piece right most of the time i see that people want to sit down and then they think there's going to be some magical muse that taps you on the head with an idea sometimes you actually have to work for the idea and build the idea a lot of brainstorming first maybe writing rather than drawing so that you can get a sense of what a cool idea would be for this that or the other and then you can go in and start researching it with reference you can start to kind of sketch some of the ideas that might look good for something like that right but those two things, when they come together, you're going to tend to have a little bit more success with that if your motivation is sapped. The other part of it is if, you know, put those things that are distracting away, right? Put some time aside, find a quiet place to work because distractions exist plentiful. Uh, distractions exist um, in our world, so it can be difficult for sure. Hopefully that's helpful. Uh, HBO Max, I thought I recognized the name, it's a product. Why does the door have a cover? Just so it's some uh better contrast for the uh the camera instead of seeing a white door behind me um okay so we've got uh get back to this so we've got kind of like a nice stab at it i mean there's varying different places we could go with this at this point um 
you know, I hope to get to color with this, but I think it's sort of really good to, to kind of make sure that some of that stuff is, is planted in here. And, uh, and so, you know, like at this point we could start to actually get in, in there with color. So, you know, one of the things I'll, I, I would do is set up a gradient map where I can start to kind of map some of the uh, values in a piece. For me personally, I like to set up an underpainting in a lot of my work um, that is warmer, right? Um, where I've tinted things away from being gray um, and now they have this sort of underlying color about them. So we can have something like that. At this point, I can get on uh, on a layer above that. Start, uh, start kind of pushing color into it. Right? Like if we were using a mid-tone from a reference, we could start to uh, start to work that in on top um, with the overlay that I've got going on. That may not be completely what I want to see in there. So sort of like a color tinting, I think is going to be a bit better for us in there, starting to kind of just work in a more believable skin tone on her. All right, so I could, uh, could get that going on, kind of work some of that out. We might go with something a bit more and test some ideas out. Maybe something a bit more blue on the legs. Maybe she's got jeans on. <clears throat> Sometimes what I'll do is I, I really will just play with color. You know, I'm not being super strict about where I'm placing this uh, on the body. Right, because sometimes I don't know. Maybe sometimes it's it will feel good in the, the first on the first look, but then I kind of keep going with it, and it's like not feeling great after that. So little things like that. Maybe the horse will be more of a. Let's get rid of our model there. More of a color like this. So with that underpainting, you see I'm painting over top of it. If I have any gaps in between these strokes, however, <clears throat> um, that red will come through and it'll feel a little bit more lively and, and full of life than just gray, for instance, right? So that might be something that just creates this believability factor in, in your work. Um, instead of it feeling like uh, some art, if you don't do sort of an underpainting or you don't treat the values properly, they can start to look very gray and dull, which is not what we want. <clears throat> something like that. We could always put something on the sky and behind. We can just create a clipping mask, which clips down to that layer. So only only that will be lit up. <clears throat> Here we could do an overlay. <clears throat> and in. Our background painting we can go in to our <clears throat> excuse me the uh, the mask and and then just delete that have some of that light come through back there right which is eliminating it for anything that it's crossing over right but you can see just sort of how the mask will work in a case like that and that's sort of the effect that I would want but I may want some of that uh, underpainting back and so I can go into the mask with white and paint her back in, right? Which is uh, which is nice. It might she might have a red bandana on. I like that. She sort of looks like it's almost like a little beacon on her. Um, but I do want the warmth back in her body, at least at this stage, 
right? Let's start kind of roughing that in. Definitely in the hair. I want there to be, once the light shines on her hair, I want there to be some nice warmth within that. I can pick just the pixels in that layer if I want to kind of create a mask easier. Go to select, load selection, it'll load the transparency, right? Then I can come back up into here and then just press, uh, <clears throat> press delete. Whoops. We want to invert that actually, then press delete. And then we'll have her being sort of warmly lit, her and the horse a little bit. I'd have to kind of fix some of that on the ear of the horse. Nice, easy way though, of kind of committing that just to some of the things that we are looking at there. <clears throat> and then in behind, we can do any sort of something like that if I wanted to start laying in some cool sort of lighting as it would move back. I'd probably still on top of that want to get in there with an overlay of, of some of the kind of rusty red rock stuff. And even then maybe I'd want to shift that a bit. It might be better as a hue, actually. Kind of get that going on. I want it to feel like a desert, after all. <coughs> so let's uh, select the same thing. See if it gives us a good transparency selection. Pretty good. <coughs> and I can come back here and just run that out to the edges. On some of these things, it's not selecting, so I'd have to go and manually do that. But that's not a bad, it's not a bad time. Can always kill off a little bit of saturation if we feel like it's getting a bit dominant in there. It's a good place to get it to, though, and then the foreground would just be manual painting because it wasn't grabbing that. The transparency might be too high. In a situation like that for the uh, selection to work that well but uh, what's nice about this is I can then get in there with the mask and I can start kind of masking this out if I want to bring a bit of that blue back in so that would be like maybe the distant land in there maybe this guy as he kind of travels around the side we get a little bit of a weaker representation of some of that color for instance right um, that might work really well for us. Let's move that back down a bit. And I can have this just sort of fade around the edges and out into that space. Uh, it just depends on what you're after. Like for me, I might leave it like that for now just because I would want to work on her and make sure that she she feels really good um, and uh, get that done first. Like her jeans, I think, are a little bit... Um, <clears throat> a little bit blue I kind of wanted her to have like a lot of kind of darker sort of brooding vibes so I might go into something more of a desaturation for that kind of make it a bit darker do that for her leather vest so I don't need that. Uh, that underpainting for something that wouldn't be warm, like like a vest like this, right? So we can just even stub that. Stub that in, see how it feels. Even her shirt would probably not be. That could be something that's a bit brighter, or sorry, more desaturated. It's gonna be like cotton, right? So it's not gonna have any sort of transparency to it. Like so, the boots definitely will be dark. Her gun belt, maybe her belt is also black. Like I'm just looking for things that will make her 
costume kind of come out, right? So I'm just roughing this stuff in. See how it feels. The hat, definitely. See, I'm starting to paint some of those other things out. Well, I'll get back in there with the uh, selection tool that we just used to, to get rid of that feel, right? But uh, yeah, it's not feeling too bad in there. So I would just go into the, the, the layer of the actual painting. Go into select, load selection. Use that transparency. Control shift invert, control shift I. And then I can come back in here and just obliterate the stuff that painted outside the lines. Um, so it is good to to have sort of like a solid layer where you everything's kind of been masked out or erased properly so that you can get those other things kind of coming in there. And uh, yeah, we start to kind of materialize with our character um, the the look. I mean, there's there's a lot to... There's a lot to kind of figure out here in terms of maybe the horse hair that might be dark. Like I may really want her to feel like uh, even her horse is sort of like this stark, dark element. But I also want to make sure sort of like the, the uh, saddle feels different than the saddle or the, the blankets, the riding kind of blankets in there. Right, so those things will be something that I would go in and tweak. Some of the leather bags might still feel good, really warm like they are. Um, and then we get to other elements like the metal on the gun or the, the butt of the gun. Those things can start to become a little bit different in there. So lots of fun though, to be able to kind of just start breaking into those spaces and starting to work out the color um, as we as we develop it. So we got at least that far. We started to rough in some colors. So we'll probably take one more, one more stab at this next week to, to show some, uh, some more color polish to get it closer to at least a visual target of what we want. It might be just like sort of the head area, but uh, there you go. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's great to have everybody on the stream today. We'll be back on Thursday uh, to, um, bring in something new uh, we put sort of pin in our alien containment unit um, maybe we'll spend like a half an hour on it just to kind of go over what we did but uh, we'll look forward to a new concept so stay tuned for that otherwise have a great week everybody uh, make sure you're practicing the anatomy and the life drawing warm up make it easy to stay motivated and uh, we'll see you guys next time thanks everybody